friends. The mere fact that we ask the question, why does God permit this war, is in itself an indication of want of trust, either in the wisdom or the goodness of God. How explain this want of trust? Generally, it is due to a refusal to admit, first, the possibility that God knows more than I and is better than I. And secondly, that my dignity is not lowered by submitting myself to his wisdom and his goodness, even when they go against me. The ultimate manifestation of pride is self-deification, setting oneself up as God. That is why the intellectually proud man will attempt to convince you of his omniscience. He steals the mantle of God's wisdom and drapes it about his own shoulders. His favorite trick in conversation is to make you think he knows everything. The result is that today we have information, but not wisdom. Information is uncorrelated bits of knowledge, which like a broken egg can never be composed into a complete philosophy of life. Wisdom, on the contrary, is a knowledge of truth, human and divine. Information and quiz programs have indoctrinated us into believing that the man who knows the colors of three beards mentioned in Hamlet is wise, and that if you do not know similar patches of information, you really ought to dissolve into an emotional crumble. True wisdom, on the contrary, correlates information into causes and equips itself to answer such questions as, what is the purpose of life? Why are we here? And where are we going? A little child who knows the first page of the catechism, which sums up the wisdom of Aristotle and the best thinking of Western culture, knows more than all those university professors whose define religion, as an Ohio professor does, as the projection into the roaring loom of time of a unified complex of psychical values, whatever that means. The salvation of modern man lies not in the pride of what he knows, but in humility concerning how little he knows. His omniscience must give way to nescience. Instead of feeling he knows everything, he must come a little closer to the truth that he really knows nothing. His belief that he knows all must surrender to the humiliating truth that someone is wiser than he. For if a man knows all, how can God teach him anything? If there is no law above him, how can he ever be wrong? If the mind is filled with self, how fill it with the wisdom of God? Not until we become humble can there be trust. For an illustration of this, turn to the book of Job. There was once a man in the land of Hus, whose name was Job. And that man was simple and upright, fearing God and avoiding evil. As the story is unfolded, Jacob was, Job rather, was gradually divested of all the things that clothe the spirit of a man, those things on which a man leans for help and strength. First he lost his wealth, and then he lost his children seven sons and three daughters. Next, his health, then the love and consolation of his wife. And Job's only reflection was, if we have received good things at the hands of God, why should we not receive evil? 
we see now the naked spirit of the man. There were only two things that were left. God and himself. God he never denied. Himself he could not escape. But between God and himself there seemed to be no place of meeting, no reconciliation, for here was a man who was suffering, but not because he had done any wrong. And Joe begins to ask questions. Why did I not die in the womb? Why received upon the knees? Why suckled at the breasts? Why is light given to him that is in misery and life to them that are in bitterness of soul? And there came to Job and he asked these questions a comforter whose name was Elihu, who talked like a university professor who never understood his philosophy well enough to tell it in simple language. And he began a long speech on the justice and the power of God. Never before in the history of the world was any speech cut short more abruptly. For it was not man but God who broke in upon the intellectual droolings of that man and out of the whirlwind God asked, Who is this? that wrappeth up sentences in unskillful words. How would you feel if you sat alongside of the bed of a sick friend, offering him consolation out of the depths of your great wisdom, and then have God come along and cut short your consolation in your words by asking a question like that? But now that God appears on the scene... Should we not expect an answer to those questions which Job asked? Certainly if a Broadway dramatist were putting on this play, he would have God step onto the stage, answer all of the questions of Job, solve all the problems of evil, or else ring up a cash register and give away a gold mine. Everything in the universe would click. There would be no loose edges. We would know all when we left the theater. But the God of heaven's way does not do things like the God of Broadway. When the true God appeared on the stage, what does he do? Here was the supreme expert on the supreme quiz program. Information, please. And God is here to give it. But lo and behold, instead of answering the questions of Job, God begins to ask Job questions. Instead of giving information, he dispensed wisdom. And this is how God began. Gird up thy loins like a man, Job, and I will ask thee, answer thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if thou hast understanding. Upon what are its bases grounded? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? Who shut up the sea with doors when it broke forth as issuing out of a womb? Have the gates of death been opened to thee? And hast thou seen its stalks and doors? Where is the way where light dwelleth and where is the place of darkness? Didst thou know thou wouldst be born? And 
Dost thou know the number of thy days? Hast thou entered into the storehouses of the snow? Or hast thou beheld the treasures of the hail? Who is the father of rain? Who begot the drops of dew? Out of whose womb came the ice? And the frost from heaven, who hath gendered it? Shalt thou be able to join together the shining stars, the Pleiades? Or canst thou stop the turning about of the Arcturus? Canst thou bring forth the day star in its time and make the evening star to rise upon the children of earth? Who hath put wisdom in the heart of man? Or who gave the cock understanding? Will the eagle mount up at thy command and make her nest in high places? Shall he that contendeth with God be so easily silenced? Surely he that reproveth God ought to answer him. That was the speech of God. And in that whole speech of God, no reference was made to the suffering of Job. No explanation was offered for anything that had transpired. But God did one thing. He brought Job face to face with the universe in which he lived. Asked him if he were equal to creating it, to governing it even to the fall of a sparrow. And made him see that he was a very small part of a vast and mighty whole. And when God finished asking Job questions, Job realized that the questions of God were more satisfying than the answers of man. That the true nations into whose abyss he was driven was really the beginning of wisdom. Job saw now that he had been asking only one question. How could his individual personal problem be solved and God's answer was that his question was but one of a million others and until he could understand the answer to those million questions he never could understand the answer to that one and like Job None of us can understand how our own individual problems fit into the great general plan of God. It is easy for us to fall into the error of thinking that the laws of the universe should be suspended or interrupted every time a good man gets in trouble. If the business of religion was merely to get the religious out of trouble, Religion would cease to be religion. It would become a kind of insurance policy, which would be the end of religion for the simple reason that it would be faithless. A mouse that crawls into a grand piano and has its gnawing of the keys disturbed by a great artist entertaining an audience with a Mozart or a Chopin must in its own puny little brain think that the universe is without a plan. And the spider which weaves its web on the girder of a great steel beam that is lifted into a bridge cannot possibly understand how its own little plan for catching flies must give way to the engineer's greater plan of transportation. Tapestries are woven not from the front, but from the back. And it is only when the last thread is drawn that we see the completed design. As Father Tab put it, my life is but a weaving between my God and me. I may but choose the colors. He worketh skillfully. Full off he chooses sorrow and I in foolish pride forget he sees the upper 
and I, the underside. We live in the midst of evil days, it is true, but it is not because God is not good. It is because the world has not been good. About one third of the civilized world today has crucified him. Another third has abandoned him. And the other third, while living good lives as individuals, has not yet had enough influence to affect the political, economic, and moral life in which they live. And this war, let us be sure about it, is not for freedom any more than the last war was for democracy. It is for something more than that. It is rather a titanic struggle to decide whether in the next few centuries we shall live by the moral law rooted in God or in the law of force rooted in Satan. Whether we know it or not, we are fighting for a moral order not just because we willed it in God, but because our enemies, thank God, have forced us into that position. It may take some time before we realize the greatness of our cause. We may first have to lose something of what we have gained, but let it not be said that while unconsciously fighting for a morality rooted in God, we consciously abandon trust in God who alone can save. Does this make the plea for a daily holy hour? Were Jews and Protestants and Catholics any clearer? Do you not see that unless the Jews and the Protestants, according to the light of their conscience, while praying for the truth, and the Catholics in the fullness of their faith and the real presence of our Lord on the altar, Unless they make public daily profession of their trust in God, we as a nation may lose the moral objective that justifies this war. And we may even lose the God who gave us peace. And anyone who would like a holy hour book of meditations to assist him in this hour of meditations each day may write for it and we will gladly send it to him. Last week I received about Seventy sheets of paper on which there were written tens of thousands of little crosses or dashes, each of which indicated a prayer to Our Lady, Queen of Peace. They were sent to me by the third and fourth grade children of St. Peter's School in Delano, Minnesota. These little children are the spiritual MacArthur's of America. The moral arsenals from which our country will draw its best citizens in years to come. And as adults, our duty is greater. And greater because guns and bullets alone will not win this war. We need them, certainly. But we need more a realization that some of our enemies have the devil on their side and man is no match for the devil. That is why we will either return to God or we will perish. Lose not then your trust in God. He has not failed. This is a time of probation. When you go to a mystery play in the theater, do you walk out in the first act because one of the good characters is killed or because evil is momentarily victorious? Do you judge the play by the first few lines? If you believe the dramatist has a plot, why do you not give God credit for having a plot? Perhaps this war is so far only in the first scene of the first act.
as in it we witness the bitter fruits of our complacency and the onward march of our enemies. We may yet have to sit through a few more acts before we become wise like the prodigal or before we become humble. Patience, then. Patience. He that would have cake out of wheat must tarry the grinding. What wound ever healed except by degrees? And our world is wounded. If you must, give up your faith in everything else, in credit, in mass production and in wealth, but surrender not your faith in him alone who can save. Say then to your soul, My soul, sit then a patient looker-on. Judge not the play before the play is done. The plot hath many changes. Every day speaks a new scene. The last act crowns the play. O Lord Jesus Christ, who in thy mercy heareth the prayers of sinners, pour forth, we beseech thee, all grace and blessing upon our country and its citizens. We pray in particular for the President, for our Congress, for all our soldiers, for all who defend us in ships, whether on the seas or in the skies, for all who are suffering the hardships of war. We pray for all who are in peril or in danger. Bring us all after the troubles of this life into the haven of peace and reunite us all together forever, O oh dear Lord, in thy glorious heavenly kingdom.